I'm delighted to be with you guys. Like, uh, like Scott said, it wasn't that long ago that I was sitting in the back of the room, not this room, it was when they, it was in, I think, 710, the Entrepreneur Lecture Series, and was really inspired by one of the gentlemen speaking that day. I think what stood out to me was just that he spoke from the heart, that it was like, you know, not as much rhetoric coming through, not saying all the little cliche things that we say, like scaling my business, and at the end of the day, and all of these little one-liners. Um, Hopefully I have fewer of those and more of just kind of honest from the gut, like what my experience was. Um, but first, I think uh, I'll give you just a little bit of context. So uh, this is me and my father. Uh, this is a port in Rotterdam. I took him there last year. We uh, were out of each other's lives for a long time. I was raised by my mom um, in Pleasant Grove locally. And uh, my dad, we rekindled our relationship. Uh, you know, in this type of a setting, I can say like, uh, there's my startup and then there's all the important things in life like the atonement and, and this was one of those things for me that was meaningful. I, I share it not to um, go down the spiritual path necessarily but to actually share sort of how I was thinking about risk as a young kid. So this is a, uh, in Rotterdam. This is where my father is a nine-year-old and his family got on a big boat, took an 11-day journey. It turned into 12 days because of storm at sea. My grandma slid across the, um, the, the boat and broke her knee at one point. It was so bad. Um, it was pretty amazing to go there and understand and appreciate um, kind of where I came from in a sense. Um, I share this because as a kid, I grew up and it was like, you know, lower middle class, worked my tail off in sports and academics and thought that my path, um, the secure path, the, the path of less risk and high return would be a professional path. And so for me, it was med school. I was at BYU, I was a business major because I wanted to be different than all the biology majors out there and uh, worked my tail off and eventually stumbled into something that I think has, is worth listening to. So just by raising hands, like how many of you have thought, I had an idea that you thought could be a viable business? Okay, how many of you have pursued an idea that you thought could be a viable business? So fewer, maybe like, you know, a, a fifth or a sixth of those raise their hands. So there's some disconnect there. There's ideas that are brewing um, you're here exposed to people who inspire you and, and uh, things that you read and come across that you process maybe in a different way and, and it just sparks something. But then there's this drop off sometimes of us being willing to pursue an opportunity. For me as a kid, like I would never have told you I was going to go on to start a company here, you know, move it to San Francisco, move to Beijing to start it, and then now I would be investing in startups. Like it would just seem like, God, oh, that's risky, right? Um, you know, in other words, we sort of think about our path as something linear, right? But, and we should, right? Your schooling, for some strange reason, is broken up not by how much you learn, but by time. You graduate from kindergarten, and then from elementary school, and then middle school, and so on. And it just continues in this cycle as if it's all just a linear path that leads to something great. And sometimes it does. Um, but here's what I discovered. So a couple of years back, after I had sold my company, I was in California. I'm with my cousin. He's getting ready to, he's applying to B school. He ends up going to the University of Chicago. Great school, right? Um, and we're talking there, and I'm asking him about the applications, all the test prep, which schools are on the top of his list. And he's asking me about my startup and what it was like to grow it and sell it and all these things. Um, and he makes the comment. He goes, and I'd love to do a startup, but there's just so much risk. It's just so risky. Um, and at the time, I don't think I had a great response. I think I was like, yeah, that's, that's just not registering for me. I don't view my path as risky. Um, and so since then, it's like, you know, when you, when you say something over the pulpit and then afterwards, like, yeah, I should have said this and this, and like, all comes to you. Since then, I've thought about that and I've thought of my response. And, you know, the way I would respond is, look, two years and for him, a hundred grand, that's risk. Right? That's a lot of money and that's a lot of time in kind of your prime or the beginning of your prime. Um, that's risky. Now, it's a calculated risk. Don't get me wrong. And then if you're headed toward business school, fabulous. But it's a risk. That's a real calculated risk. Um, going through your undergrad for four years sequentially, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and going to every class, that's a risk to me looking back. So let me share with you what happened to me. I'm an econ, what's the tough one, 110? I hated that class. I took it in the spring so that I could just fast track it and retain as much as I could during that time. And I'm sitting in one class and I have one of those opportunities, like an idea. And I'm just like, 
forget this. I walk out, I write this two-page letter to my buddy. We served in the same mission together, and he ends up becoming my business partner in that business, the one after, the one after, and the one most recently that we shared, Zinch, right? One of my best friends. Um, had I sat in that class and just sat through it and not made a decision for that point to leave my education, my formal education, to pursue my first startup, nothing would have been put into motion. Now again, is that, does that mean you should do that? No, all I'm saying is, to me, if you wanna talk about risk, it's going about your day to day without taking sometimes those curveballs you're thrown and taking a swing at it, right? Um, uh, to me, a risk is waiting. It's actually just like, it, it's funny, there's always the, there's this notion of like, when I have more money, then I'll do all these things, right? Um, I'm telling you, my first startup, I, I was six months married. We had to move into an apartment with my business partner, the guy I just mentioned, and my wife, like six months into it, that adds like a wrinkle to it. When we, our business started going, we had a child. I decided to come back to BYU and finish my studies while running my business. So I would spend two weeks in Provo, one week in Detroit, fly back, Frontier Airlines, with a daughter, like a little baby. You know, some of those flights, she was screaming the whole time. It was like, you know, when you're listening to that baby crying in the plane, you're just like, oh, like either you hate that family or you feel bad for that family, depending on if you've had kids or not. Uh, it just, it never gets convenient. Did my startup in China, super inconvenient. Had a special needs child when we were there. Like horribly, it never gets easier. So to me, risk is business school an uninterrupted undergrad waiting for some special moment in your life. So I would just challenge, and I hope in some of this, if nothing else, it's somewhat entertaining, but, oh, one more risk that I wanna mention, actually. Um, the other risk is listening to a talking head, me or whomever else, who's made millions of dollars in a startup and somehow putting them on a pedestal like they are more brilliant or more talented or that you have to have a startup that in X years yields X millions of dollars. I just think it's risky, and here's why. It's easy for us to talk about it. And if I were to say to you, keeping up with the Joneses, do you get a negative connotation or a positive connotation? Negative. negative, right? If I say keeping up with the Josh Jameses, first of all, you're like, well, I've never heard of that. But to me, that's like, so Josh James, I admire him. He was an investor in my last startup. I think the world of Josh, uh, fabulous. The risk we run in listening to Josh or anybody else who's had some success, moderate to phenomenal, um, you know, we see all their billboards up and down I-15, is that at some point we start to elevate them and we make a startup and pursuing an idea, this like billion dollar event that is super binary. You either win or you lose. And so it becomes risky. So when I, so when I, you know, hence a cousin of mine getting ready for business school saying, I would love to do a startup, but that seems so risky. So just my two cents kind of pointing into all of this. Um, for me, uh, and inherent in art in my startup was um, not taking something at face value, right? The ideas that you have, that, that your day-to-day as you go through, feeling something that just doesn't seem right. You know, we, find, we live in a time where you can have an idea and throw it on Kickstarter and just see if others agree with you or not, right? Um, for us, it was our education, actually. So, you know, I talk about this and share how I perceive risk because that was inherent to, my, to our startup. We had gone through, the three founders, um, our experience was very similar. We kind of grew up local guys, local yokels in Utah. Um, felt like we had some mojo and, and some um, uh, and decent enough grades, and we were overlooked by certain schools, and we just felt like that was strange. Like, couldn't this be done differently? You know, in a day and age where, like, I can connect human to human through something like Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn, why is it so hard to create a connection with the university? And so we built a site to, to serve that, where students could convey who they were. and. Um, and do so in an intuitive way for them, based on an experience they were used to, and in a useful way to schools, because now a school can say, I want to connect with a female from Nebraska who wants to study engineering and live in Massachusetts. And now we have schools that would be delighted to have communication with those students. So that was kind of where we started with all this. Um, the other piece to this that I think is interesting, um, and, and the other thing I guess I would interject is if you have a question along the way, please just raise your hand. Um, I hope this doesn't become just too uh, much of me talking. Um, and then afterwards, if you want to join the Q&A, I have a buddy who, who recently published a book that I think is fabulous, and I, I, I bought as many as he had printed so far, and I'll give those away to people who have a good question. Um, so if you look and, and unwind our startup, it's interesting. Um, 
people came and left at different times. I happened to see it all the way through for whatever reasons. It just worked out for me. And, and it was fun to see this from inception to raising $8 million and all to selling it for $50 million to um, going and flying to New York and, and being listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It was a really cool experience. Um, but, uh, but to go back to my first point uh, of it isn't all or nothing. So super interesting in our group. If you were to look at companies right now in Utah, from our group, I did the math. I was sitting there in San Francisco a couple weeks ago getting, getting ready to meet with the guy who I had worked with years past. He was one of our first hires. Super bright. He's getting to raise. It's not public yet. It's not close. So I won't say how much, but somewhere between, let's say, 5 and $10 million. He's getting, to, getting ready to raise money for his startup. And, um, and we're talking, and I'm thinking to myself, this is so cool that like years ago we were just sitting there in cheap office space in downtown Provo thinking about this idea, and now you know, this company has done this, he has a new company that's getting ready to crush it. And so I started doing the math and looking over it, and that was the case for every single person on that founding team. So not only do I think there's less risk in, in a startup than many other paths, but I think there's actually huge opportunity um, that you don't necessarily realize in that first start. Let me explain. In that early group, there was myself, there was a guy named Nick Hagen, my co-founder. Mick has since founded a company called Undrip, didn't work out, and now a company called Spatch. He just raised $3 million. He's in Techstars London, right? This company, is, it, it's, they're doing some really cool things to disrupt email. There was Brad Hagen, my other co-founder. He has since had two startups, one called Finds, a, a cool app, and now Studio, a venture-backed app. I personally invested, and our fund just invested in this, and it's locally. A um, really cool design tool for, uh, for pictures that you post on Instagram. Um, Ryan Caldwell. Ryan Caldwell is the CEO of MX, or Money Desktop. You may have heard of it. You may have seen their billboards somewhere, right? Um, Cash Merrill, our CTO, founded a company called ZipTech, and was most recently on it with, he's with a company called QuotaDeck, which just was the first Utah company in Techstars Boulder, uh, a big accelerator and very well known kind of in the community um, of, of startups and entrepreneurship. Uh, but, it, but it keeps going. So then we have Dave Blake. Um, he founded a company called Degree. Degreed uh, is doing some super cool stuff, and two of our other early guys also joined him. Every single person from top to bottom. Collectively, we've employed, since Zinch, over 200 people. We've raised over 60 million, I did the math, in capital, and we've already returned 100 million. And, it's, and, and most of those companies are still going and still have yet to return money. I'm not getting you know, too into that, but it takes, um, even though your company's growing, you don't realize the actual value in terms of dollars oftentimes until something happens like an acquisition or an IPO. Um, so you look at that and you just go, geez, like all that was were a lot of people in different paths leaving consultancies, um, leaving their undergrad, two people haven't graduated yet, right? Leaving um, other things that they were working on to come together to pursue something that they thought was interesting. Um, so I I'm extremely biased, but I think you should think about those ideas you're having and, and do something about it. Um, and this is a snapshot of some of those. So that's Ryan. Um, early on, that's Cash, who's a big, um, who, who did Zip Tech. It's Brad, it's of course myself. Um, so, um, questions? Sorry, I'm not. I'm not giving you great opportunities to ask questions. Um, but please, in fact, let's just. I'll just pull out a couple books just to kind of at least get some engagement going. And this isn't purely me talking. So this is really cool. Um, there are multiple accounts of the first vision. Sometimes people use it to attack our faith. Um, a good friend of mine, um, and we serve in the church together, just published a book that actually takes 10 accounts from the Sacred Grove and brings them together in a super cool way so you can kind of see the different accounts and what it provides. All right, so for the a cu first couple good questions in here, I just want to give away a book um, because uh, hopefully I can bribe you a little. Please. Can you tell us a little bit more about your timeline of when you decided to start working on your startup, how old you were, when you graduated? Yeah. So I was, I was a year back from my mission. So I, was, I had put in a year at the University of Utah. I played basketball there, had a great experience on my mission. Basketball became less important. I came to the Y uh, and, uh, and was, I mean, literally, yeah, in my first. So I left as like June, somewhere between sophomore and junior years when I first pursued my startup. Not this one. There was actually three preceding it and, uh, and left school for a semester, no, I left it for a full year, and then after a year when we got it going was when I started doing this like jumping back and forth, like, you know, I had an apartment in Detroit and an apartment in Provo. Uh, yeah. You want to come grab this book? Okay, okay. Please. Did you always have a lot of ideas, or was it just a few that you kept coming back? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not an idea guy. So uh, even when I say, have you had ideas, like for me it was more opportunity. It was somehow a, a conversation with a friend. Like I've always been fortunate to have people in the group. Here's an example. So I mean, even this group, the idea for Zinch China came from this guy. His name's Tom. He was a um, Yale undergrad. Uh, he worked for McKinsey. He was, um, went to Harvard Business School, was a Baker Scholar at Harvard Business School, which means you're like somebody who's like deep in everything. It's top of your class type of person. Brilliant guy. He, um, he ran BizDev for a company called um, CNET. You may have heard of it. CNET does reviews for technology, like camcorders or all these sort of things. So, um, so in terms of ideas, like for me it was actually finding and listening to and, and, and appreciating there are people brighter and smarter that just either weren't in that stage of their life you know, to, to take something, and I could be that guy. I could be the one to cut my teeth on an idea, raise capital around it, rally around it. So Tom, really, if you talk about so we launched our company in China. This is a picture of us on the Great Wall. If it isn't obvious, our early team. Um, this is my mentor, a guy who lives in Park City named Mike Leventhal. Um, he was instrumental. He had uh, been in many longtime venture capitalists from the Bay Area. He was somebody that early on I was like, man, I've got to listen to these people smarter than me. So no, I think I would I would think about it less of having a great idea, more of being open to breaking from that linear path, you know, we're great in that we follow, right? And we can appreciate and be proud of the fact that, like, we are proud to follow and to, um, and to, um, what's the right word? Um, um, subject, that's the wrong word. That sounds like it. In our faith, right? Kind of like, like, we appreciate the fact that um, we will do things out of faith, right? What I'm saying is there's other parts of your life, and you don't need to just take it for what it is, right? Uh, particularly your career and your future. Like, it, it's worth taking some risks on. Right in the middle? Okay. I'm from China. I have a question about the Zinch in China. Yeah. What uh, competitive advantage do you think Zinch is over the millions of the other organizations, similar organizations in China, which is so competitive in this overseas education market? Great question. So, if you're from China, you're familiar with like a Zhongjie, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, and they have a lot of money, and they're and they're able to attract a lot of students. So you have education agents in China. This lady would know. In China, education is like family is is above everything, right? Um, and education is like bolted right on. And it's a little different than in the U.S., where we have a certain respect for kind of public institution that um, because we've had relative stability in our country since the revolution that formed us, that there's no reason not to with, have huge distrust in it. In China, it's a little bit different. If you grew up in a time where your parents, so one of my coworkers, literally her mom, when she was young, one morning in the middle of the night, was taken from her home and sent to Inner Mongolia and lived in a yurt, if you know what a yurt is, and raised sheep. She was coming from a huge city, Beijing, did that for five years. Taken back to her family, Hey, mom, hey, dad, never said a word more. It's called the Cultural Revolution. Pretty crazy, like, turning upside down of a country. Because of that, in the Chinese culture, like, your families, like, you would, you would serve your family's needs above public institution. Where here, we, we never run into that conflict of interest there. You, you kind of do. So education is bolted right on to how you think about making decisions. Um, for that reason, there's huge amounts of money early on that go into people like test prep and all these things. Like, we think about it when we're preparing for the SAT, maybe, or ACT. There, it's like... You're, you're doing these things super early on. Our differentiation and the reason that we were able to enter China was because we couldn't compete on a local level in terms of dollars to market and be in front of Chinese students. But we had an interesting differentiation was that we had more than a thousand universities, including Stanford, MIT, Berkeley, BYU, other great schools that were our clients who were um, that we had a direct relationship with. So we could go into China and say, guess what? We understand applying to American universities better than anyone else because we have relationships with those schools. But don't take our word for it. We're going to put you directly in touch with people at those schools. So that was our unique value proposition in China. That's a good question. Um, hold that for just a second. Let, let's, uh, um, well, actually, no. Go ahead, please. So can you spend a little bit on choosing your partner uh, went to business school at BYU. Right? I, went, I did my undergrad at BYU. I, didn't, I never did business school. Okay. 
Hey, just well, interesting that rather than choosing one of your classmates, you went to one of your friends, uh, and someone who also you have a mission with. Uh, what are some of the things that you look for in partner, in people you partner with? Yeah, really good question. So if I kind of go back to, you know, whether it's the people here or the people here, um, trust, right? Um, so a couple snippets from, from this journey, like, again, to not paint this as just like some walk in the park. So there was a point where, um, where Brad here, we were sitting in Ryan's home, and I was like in tears, devastated, had a, had a tragedy, I lost a member of my family, um, my younger brother actually, and, uh, and I was like done with it. I was like, guys, like, life just doesn't have any savor right now. Like to me, thinking of going in and like working on a website is just silly. Like I just want to like crawl up in a hole and think about my bro. Um, so I had Brad then who just looks at me, because I tell him, I say, just take my equity in the company, like peace out. And he's like, you know what, man, take the time you need. Like take whatever time you need. That's the type of a partner that you want. Like somebody who, you know, Brad will hold you accountable. Like this isn't just touchy-feely. But when you have, to have those times in your life when it's crazy, and believe me, if, if I didn't start for eight years, any of us, in eight years' time, you're going to see some sort of struggle, personal struggle, family struggle. Just wait till you get married and have kids. Like, it only compounds. Wait till you have in-laws and, and children of your in-laws. Like, it's just, there's people, and people have struggles. And um, so you, you want people that share the same ideals, that have the real same vision of what you're trying to do with it. So early on, me, Brad, another co-founder who's not in this particular picture, we're sitting in a McDonald's in Santa Monica, California. We had an offer for a million bucks to acquire our company. This is after like six months of building it. So we're doing the math and I'm like, dang, six months, divide a million and a third, that's a pretty good paycheck. Better than like I've ever made in my life. Um, and, and again, that's, that's where like comparing it to like the time in my mind as a kid of like going through med school, paying off debt, making money, like it was just like, night and day in terms of your, what you can create uh, value-wise these days in our world through tech startup. It's just cool. Um, but we're sitting there and we're eating like a Big Mac and, uh, and we're like, should we do it? Like, should we sell this? You know? And, and, and then we all looked around and we all had the like, same feeling like, no way. Like, no way. We haven't even taken this thing to see what we can really create. So we all gulped down whatever we were drinking and uh, went back to that, the, the gentleman who invited us out, flew us out to, to offer to acquire our company and said, hey, we're going to keep building this and um, hopefully talk to you later and you offer us more money than that. I don't know. Um, so, uh, so you've got to share the same ideals and vision for what you want. Some people, um, I, I think that's a challenge sometimes with MBAs coming out of BYU is it's harder when you put time and money into your MBA. You, have, you had your summer internship. You had your job offer. And you're like, I want to go pursue that. And partner's like, maybe you should go pursue that. You see fewer MBAs that will pursue that, that sometimes opportunity and idea than you do undergrads. And again, there's not a right or wrong. I don't want to disparage those who are going that path because um, we've hired fabulous MBAs and they've contributed enormously to the growth of our company. <coughs> Question? So. And then when you're done with the question, I'll talk about the acquisition and what this was like in that change. Go ahead. For you, what was so special about BYU that you decided to fly out here and finish your undergrad doing, going through, I'm sure that was a big ordeal, rather than just applying to a different school? Undergrad? Yeah, probably two things. I mean, one, I really value education. Like, you know, my grandfather's, the other side of the family immigrated from Mexico here, um, and not like Mormon colonies, like, you know, straight up Catholic, you know, we, we, they, my parents converted to this faith, but, um, um, but my grandpa came, he had a second, he, he dropped out of school after the second grade to help the family. He worked in a brick factory turning bricks as they cooled, made 50 cents a day. That guy, I'm named after him, um, although he's Sideronio, I'm just Sydney, the American, the like white, white version of it. Um, but uh, he, uh, he read the newspaper from front to back. And this is back when like newspapers were burly newspapers, not like the little things we see now. And, and we just kind of pick and choose because of the luxury of sort of our ability to, to um, curate information from the internet, right? But back then, I mean, big old newspaper. He read it front to back, and he would give me nickels from his winnings in Vegas. He, he was in LA, and everyone saw he'd go out to Vegas, and he loved the slot machines. I would get like stacks of nickels or a bag of nickels for my report card. So he just emphasized education. So even still, I value it. Like my kids, they're, you know, education is hugely important to us. The other part was 
BYU is super unique. I mean, this, I deal with, we, we've worked with a thousand institutions across the U.S. And the president of the university recently I mean, shared something interesting where if you look at a lot of these schools, Yale and others included, they used to have a Christian um, foundation to what they were doing. And it's grown beyond that. And it's grown into professors that are concerned about research. And, and again, things that are important. But we have something here where like, Scott has like done it. Like he's been out there, he's built businesses. He'll build more businesses. That's unique. The professors I had, because I was a business undergrad, um, every single one of my prof professors had been there and done that. And I just love like talking to people who had both. They like could teach and, and, and they, could, they could push, you know, and, and they appreciated the book side of things, but they were practitioners, like they had done it. They knew the failures of these things. And so in that startup, I was coming back, keep in mind, I'm running a business and I'm taking classes that are like, it's the best I've ever, it's, it's the most I've ever gotten out of these courses because I'm actually using the principles that I'm learning, like seriously. Um, so uh, I, could, I could rattle off each of these guys from marketing to who helped me to write business plans and they're just fabulous. Like you just, you don't realize what you have from a cost perspective, from a, a professor perspective, and then the other element that we have here of our faith and something that it like, again, just should cast a shadow on everything else we have. So um, does that make sense? Uh, I should probably give a book to somebody and all that. We'll save the next book for the next question. Um, how, what are, how are we doing on time? Okay, cool. Um, so, Chegg, so in this process, then, we had um, an opportunity to, we were getting ready to raise what's called a Series C round of financing. We had raised $8 million to that point. We had teed up um, to raise $12 million, another big injection to, like, take this thing to the moon. And at the same time, we had an offer from a company that was doing some really innovative things. And uh, it just made sense. They were um, coming back to the earlier gentleman's question of, like, what type of partners do you pick? You want to find alignment. It's not always perfect, but we all felt like this is the right time to kind of um, realize the fruits of our labor, I guess, uh, to, to, to have an inflection point where there could be liquidity created for people who've been working so hard for so long. The other cool part about this is, that all of a sudden, like in the realest way, our company was, I think, completely uprooted from Utah in a great way. Um, you know, we, we've got great things going on here, but the reality is the longer you're here, the more ethnocentric you probably are just gonna think. It just is what it is. It doesn't mean we're bigots. It, it just, you, when you're in an isolated place where most of us look the same, I've got a little bit of this going on, maybe just to change it up a little right now. But like, it's hard not to just think myopically and, and in a very ethnocentric way. So this was cool. I just wanted to share this because I thought it was one of those stories that just made me laugh. So I'm talking to our CEO. This guy, Dan Rosenzweig, he um, is fabulous. Like, Dr. Bob is someone I really admire, who I was fortunate to come across. Um, another one of those, like, if you look at every single phase of our business, there were always brighter people and more experienced people that we had to rally around the flag and to eventually take the flag, right? Because I worked for Dan, effectively or someone who reported to Dan. Um, so Dan's background was he was the COO at Yahoo when, uh, when Yahoo was kind of more exciting, not to knock Yahoo now, but he oversaw the investment in Alibaba. So if you know, you know, right now, Yahoo, all their value really can be traced back to Alibaba, which just had a massive IPO, right? I mean, phenomenal. Dan made that investment. He uh, was then the CEO of a company, you may know Guitar Hero, CEO of Guitar Hero, really cool guy. So. Uh, grew up in New York, uh, and uh, choice of words a little bit different sometimes than, than uh, those of us around here, colorful, lots of fun. Um, so I'm talking to him one time, and I'm presenting to him a plan for growth outside of China and other countries. And I present the whole thing, and I'm like, damn, the end of it, the last slide is like, your blessing on this. And he's like, what does that mean, Sid? I'm like, I just want your blessing on my plan. Say, so like, go for it. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's like, how do you Mormons give blessings? I'm like, huh? <laughs> like, uh, he's like, how do you guys give blessing? And I go, well, I, I would put my hands on someone's head and I would, you know, uh, and I kind of walk him through it. He goes, okay, I'm in Utah when this is happening. He's like, Ann, this is uh, the ladies with me. He's like, Ann, take a picture of me right now. Okay? And they send this to me on my phone. He's like, Sid, this is me blessing you through the phone. You have my blessing. Go for it. Go do it. Right? And I'm just like, that's awesome. Like, you know, so we have opportunities. The cool thing about pursuing, you know, these things, and, and, and when you get comfortable, it's kind of, it's not just going with the flow, but 
pursuing something that you feel kind of burning in you and is maybe different than the path you thought you'd go, you'll just have experiences that are awesome, right? I mean, I can tell you about experiences in, from San Francisco to Beijing that are just things I laugh at, things that I'll kind of cherish forever, and that's as meaningful to me as dollars in a bank account. You know what I mean? Like, these are real relationships. Someone I'll look up to when he's he's coming out with their third quarter um, earnings report soon. Like, you know, when I listen to that call, I'll sort of remember something like this happening. So it, it also, your opportunity to, um, to influence and share a little bit and dispel some of maybe the notions about who we are here are just as valuable as appreciating someone from, who grew up in the hard ranks of, like, New York and, and me being able to be like, wow, that is a good dude. And, uh, and, and has a valuable take on life. And, and I think in harmony and in tandem, we can accomplish a lot. So uh, let me pause. Questions? Next question gets a book. Um, you kind of mentioned, like, with the passing rate of learning. Certainly there was other times in your experience that weren't enjoyable. Yeah. Certainly there are times that they struggled. Yeah. Um, you want to hear about one of those? Like, what's your, what's your why? Like, why did you stay? I'm, I'm sure you also had offers to go at other, um, other places as well. Like, why did you stay where you were? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I think there was a, a strong sense of, of loyalty. Uh, and, and I don't want this to get kind of twisted because um, you're not disloyal if you, if something, if an opportunity or a life decision means you have to um, take another path. For me, so I can't speak for everyone else. My co-founders, they had other opportunities that made sense for them before our acquisition, before the IPO. And I think those were great decisions for them. For me, what I found was that I was still in a position to be challenged, and there was still something big every single year. I remember my wife like laughs at me. She's like, "You said that last year." Because every year I'm like, "This year's going to be a huge year. Like we're going to do some huge things." She's like, "Yeah, whatever. That's the last five years of the business." But <laughs> but the point was, it was like it was it was growing here. It was raising venture cap. It was raising early money here, then raising venture capital, and then 2009, like we were we were on Sand Hill Road in in, in the Bay Area had term sheets from companies, and literally, I was in, I was there in Palo Alto the day that everything crashed in our country, and all of a sudden I'm getting calls back from these venture capitalists like, yeah, remember that term sheet I gave you? Like, it, it's no good anymore. Like, our, the, the, um, um, the situation in this world in our country has like dramatically changed, right? So, um, you know, what I found was every year there was just still something big. I was still hiring. I still had the opportunity to create and innovate and, and every and my efforts each day I could measure them and see how they were impacting the business. And that's just rare. Like that's 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 the problem I would have now for working for a large company is like, I don't know what my efforts actually are contributing to. Like I guess they're somewhere contributing to the bottom line, but when you grow out of startup, it's a different reality. And, so, and, and it's just a different type of person that thrives in that reality. And I've just found that that early stage, every decision matters. You can't make a bad hire, and yet you have to figure out how to navigate it when you do make a bad hire. It's just rewarding. It, it's super cool, a lot of fun. Um, so that brings us to now. Of, uh, one question, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now and kind of why. Um, I'm just going to ask if you could identify one or maybe a couple of characteristics that differentiate that type of person that thrives in that environment from those who value education, you know, higher level education, what kind of a difference, like, what's, what makes you different, how do you see yourself as different from everybody else who wants to obtain education and follow that in your track? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. That, you know, I, uh, that leads, that relates to what I want to talk about now. So, in the first five months of being a venture capitalist, I've looked at 800 companies. Five months, 800 companies. We've invested in 11. There's more, and what we're looking for in all of those, before anything else, is the people. I'm trying to look into that person's eyes and I'm like, and here's what I'm thinking. The things that I think about are, will you, when it gets tough, be able to weather it? Like, I'm of the opinion that, and, and I got this from a, a leader of our faith, that when Moses parted the Red Seas, he was up to his neck in water. I'm convinced. Like this wasn't like standing up there and perfect timing, boom. This was like in the water, like, oh gosh, you know, it's going up like, okay, I hope this works. I mean, this, you know, I mean, really, like I, I want somebody who hell or high water is gonna weather the storm. Because what I've found is our startup could have failed at multiple points. Multiple points. Easily could have failed. We went through 2009, 
you know, our economy in the toilet. We went through disruptive like people that weren't a good fit. We had to figure that out. We went through having investors who weren't a great fit. I had to pay them back their money plus 10% on their money just to be rid of them. And I had everything I own, like mortgage on the line. It didn't dump my wife. I was like, okay, this doesn't work out. I lose it all. No kidding. So we could have failed. The only thing I think was not that I was like somehow smarter and I like saw the way to be a great marketer or salesperson. It was we waited that sucker out. We kept you know slugging slogging forward like in the mud. So I think that's part of it is one sort of the gumption, the stupidity, the foolishness to do it. You know because it is different than what most people choose to do. And then two, it's the willingness to stick it out. And even when you're like, man, did I make a bad decision? Like just to continue with it. And I think good things can happen. Uh, I wish I could paint a picture that we, you know there was something super strategic. And there were certainly business decisions along the way that I think made a lot of sense. But I didn't make most of them. There were smarter people that, that I was fortunate to work with. You know? um, so peak ventures. So in all of this, and I just shared a little bit of it, when we raised money early on, like the, you ask about a good partner. A bad partner is just as bad as a good partner is good and important to your business, and in this case, detrimental to your business. And we just had. Um, an unfortunate, I think, a little bit of a butting of heads with our early investors. And, um, and that experience inspired me then to sort of say, man, if I'm ever in a position to be an investor in startups like mine, I'm going to do, do it a little bit differently. And so a good friend of mine who I've known for about a decade, we, um, I joined him and, and we uh, just, this Scott mentioned, raised a $23 million seed fund you know, in Utah. We're focused on finding those people that we think have that, you know, whatever that quite, you know, is. And it's not perfectly quantifiable. It's more, it's more art than science. And we want to partner with them to support them in what they're doing. Um, so we've assembled um, an interesting group. Um, uh, this is my partner Jeff. We have three great guys who have experience as operators of businesses, from Fortune One to local startups. Um, and then we have a lot of great people that have like been there along the way and who are also fabulous entrepreneurs themselves and have seen businesses grow and create a big value. So um, we, I think it's come full circle. I feel super fortunate to have been like here in your seat, to have met people here at BYU, both professors and classmates who were creative to what we were building. I've seen them have been their cheerleaders as they've gone on to big, uh, build their own businesses. And now we kind of want to continue that. Um, we really think this notion of like community and what we have here is something we, we think we have something special in Utah. We think it can only get better and bigger. So we're focused on, on creating that value uh, or helping others in, in doing that. Lastly, um, and how much time do I have? Five minutes? Cool. So um, I would definitely, again, one of those things you hear people say, but it's like totally from the heart. Like I would be remiss, stupid, ignorant to my life and, and, and all the ups and downs if I didn't like look to my family in this. So, Interesting just little storylines in, in this. My first business, my wife was um, a partner in it. She was manning the phones of that business where we were running from mortgage company to mortgage company. This is before like we had smartphones sort of. Um, I bought my first laptop back then. Um, she was on a, an application called Microsoft Streets and Trips. You wouldn't use it now because we have Google Maps. But she was like in our apartment in Michigan telling me where to turn. So I know every like back road in, in Detroit, Michigan and all around Michigan. Is anybody from Michigan? Yeah, awesome. Where are you from, Michigan? Canton. Canton? Okay, yeah. So I played basketball in the, in the chapel in Canton. We would beat up on the Canton board. I was in Livonia. Um, so, um, so my wife's rat. Uh, this is this is my daughter. She, uh, my oldest. She was the one who we were in a plane and like she was screaming, you know, for three hours. That flight from Salt Lake to Detroit is like a three-hour flight, right? Three and a half. Yeah. Four. Yeah, three and a half. Um, she, uh, she also, I, she came with me to New York when we IPO'd and we sat there and took a picture together to see the big Czech flag hanging outside of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I wanted her to go to school out there. She, she's uh, fabulous. Um, without going into everybody, my daughter here, Micah, um, she was born to us in China. So this is like, you know, we're months into it, launching a company, a startup within a startup in Beijing. And she's born, which was awesome. And she's got cysts throughout her neck, mouth, everywhere here. So bad that we like, the doctors are like, I don't know, send her to the US. So I fly her and my wife back to the US. I get a call that she's going to have to have an emergency tracheostomy. I don't know if you have that, that's where like 
punch a hole through here, and you see people with some, a little tube there that they breathe through effectively. So that was my gut for the first. You can tell she doesn't have it now. So this was crazy. My wife's back, and it turned into like five weeks of her with Micah in primary children's. I have the two other kids in Beijing. I'm commuting an hour and a half to work every day on the Beijing subway. I get calls from my IE or, or our nanny who only speaks Chinese saying, oh, your son just, this son, he just locked himself in the room, and I can't, he doesn't understand me. I'm trying to tell him to turn the thing this way, and I'm like, oh, man, it was just, you know, crazy. Um, Micah, you know, Micah, fortunately, has, she's come a long way, 12 surgeries later, right, an international move that way, an international move back this way is my little sweetheart, total pistol. Um, so, in all of this, there was one point in the business where, a different one, it's like, I'm like a crybaby with my business. There was another point where there was something rough going on, and I was just like, felt like I was just done. And my wife just leaves me a note, like sitting there. I have it in my scriptures now. I can't remember to put it in my scriptures. I probably wasn't reading my scriptures then. I was too like ticked off at things. But she left me a note that was like, essentially, if it's time for you to move on, like I'm behind you, you know, and uh, and I have faith in you. So those type of things, you know, having someone in your corner, wiser, like my wife could run businesses far better than I could, but she runs the Chrome and Hook family business, and she does a really good job of it. Um, it's just. Um, all these things play into one another, right? Our business is not separate from our lives. We know that. Like, we can't be this person and that person. Um, I had a squabble with my neighbor the other day, and I'm just reminded, like, man, it's all just like you're just you all the time, and you have to learn how to do you in this, and you have to have good people in your corner and be humble when you make mistakes, and, and good things can happen. So um, I think after this, we're going to be headed upstairs, but I just want to thank you guys for listening through some of this. I hope there was more eyes on you than your cell phones. And really